Pontypool, the former mining town in the county of Gwent in South Wales. It's a very small, close-knit community. Everybody knows everybody else. It's a really nice place to live. And in September 2002, the suburb of Abersacken in Pontypool was home to Michael and Desiree Baldwin and their three children. Certainly they seemed a very close family. They were no different from anybody else uh, living near here at the time. But a series of horrendous events ripped the family apart following the sudden disappearance of their 15-year-old daughter, Jenna Baldwin. Mike just kept saying to me all the time, Des, she'll be back. Don't worry, you know what she's like. She'll be back. We were given this picture by, by friends uh, of a girl who wanted to just get away from the area, wasn't happy with life in general, a girl who, who talked about running away from home. And as officers from Gwent Police launched one of their largest ever missing persons inquiries, the true circumstances of Jenna's disappearance were exposed. Deep down, I believe Jenna had a big secret. If it was something really, really bad, she may have felt like she could have caused a lot of misery. With such a huge secret at stake, the detectives started to wonder if Jenna hadn't run away, why else would she have disappeared? Had she been abducted? Had she been injured accidentally? We had no idea where she was, but all the indicators were starting to emerge that there was a problem. Jenna Baldwin was born on the 7th of May, 1987. Oh, she was beautiful, precious, very forward. Wrote her name before she even went to nursery. My darling, really. But not long after moving to a new home in Abersacken, Jenna's parents decided to divorce. We were both 19. We were really young. We had Jenna a few years later. It just didn't work out. Um, we went our separate ways when she was 18 months old. However, Desri soon had a new man in her life. His name was Michael Baldwin. Yeah, I met Mike in 1990. We hit it off from the start. We got on really well. He was brilliant with Jenna. He um, took her everywhere he went. She loved him. She started to call him Daddy, which is what he wanted. Um, and everything was fine, great. The relationship progressed rapidly, and in 1990, Desri and Michael were married with Jenna as bridesmaid. She had a pretty little white dress with yellow flowers on it. The only thing was she wouldn't hold this pose all day. <laughs> she wouldn't hold it for the photographs or anything, but um, we all had a really nice time, a really nice day. This was a new start, a new start for three of us as a family. And to complete the family, Jenna took Michael's surname. Well, I was going to be Mrs. Baldwin, and um, Jenna wanted to be the same as her dad, as she called him then, and myself. So um, we asked Jan's real dad, and he agreed that we could change her name, and that was what she wanted. Desri and Michael went on to have two other children together, and Jenna loved having a younger brother and sister to play with. Jenna was a very good big sister. She um, would take them for walks, she'd look after them. She'd have them helping her to clean. She'd do colouring with them, painting with them, she take them swimming. They all got on really well. All in all, Jenna was the perfect child. Never had a moment's problem with her at all. She was homely, she was always in on the computer, and my best friend, really. However, when Jenna entered her teens, her relationship with her parents became fraught with difficulties. She got to 13 and she changed so quickly definitely a difficult teenager and the little girl that I'd brought up to that age just disappeared and I found that really hard because I'd never had to dis discipline her for anything. Although away from her family, Jenna's friends saw another side of the troubled teen. Most of Jenna's friends was a bit, bit older than her because she was grown up at, for her age, Jenna. She was she like a 15 year old. But when Jenna Baldwin suddenly went missing, her friends' and family's lives were changed forever. Oh, 
On Wednesday the 4th of September 2002, Desri returned home at lunchtime to find 15-year-old Jenna banging on the front door. I'd come home from work to check everything was okay because she hadn't gone to school that morning and I wanted to try and talk to her. She was banging on the door. Mike had been working nights, he'd gone to bed. The key was in the door so I couldn't open the door for her. Um, so I said to her to get in the car and I took her back up to her auntie's where she was staying. Jenna had been staying at her aunt's house following a family argument because she was refusing to attend school. She was fine during the summer because she more or less could have her own freedom, um, do what she wanted to do in the days. I wanted her to go to school. She was very bright. She was in the top set for everything. and. This was important and I wanted her to see how important it was, but she seemed reluctant to want to go back to school that first week of September. But after talking to her mother, Jenna seemed ready to make amends. She was saying to me, don't worry, ma'am, I'm going to go to school next week. I am going to go to school. And for one minute, I sensed a little bit of relief that she was actually going to come home and go to school. So I dropped her off and then I went to work. But the next day, Jenna didn't turn up for school. I didn't know that when I dropped her off on that Wednesday, that was the last time I was ever going to see Jenna. On Wednesday, the 4th of September, 2002, Desri Baldwin drove her 15-year-old daughter, Jenna, to her aunt's house in Pontypool in South Wales. Following a number of arguments about her school attendance, Jenna had been staying with her aunt, but when the weekend came, Desri became concerned that she hadn't heard from her daughter. Jenna was never difficult to get hold of. She carried her mobile, it was her life, but I couldn't get hold of her on it. I kept ringing, but there was no answer. I decided that I'd call around um, all of her friends, but I didn't get any joy, nobody had seen her. But on Monday, the 9th of September, Jenna got in touch. Mike came in and said that Jenna had phoned. I thought, oh, great, she's phoned, she's been in touch, everything's going to be fine. And the next day, Jenna briefly returned to the house. Mike said Jenna came home with a, a friend with red hair and had a shower and changed and then went. I was a little bit relieved because it's, it showed a sign that Jenna was OK, but I wasn't best pleased that I still didn't know where she was, who she was with. I was annoyed with Mike because he didn't actually take the girl's name and he just didn't seem to care that she was missing. On Thursday the 12th of September, over a week after Desri had last seen her daughter, the Baldwins were visited by Jenna's school welfare officer to discuss her truanting. I was absolutely amazed at that meeting because Mike mentioned that Jenna had been in a state with this girl when she was at the house. He'd said that her eyes were rolling. She was acting really strangely, laughing and joking around. And he tried to make up the impression that they'd taken some drugs. Having never known Jenna to use drugs, Desri was forced to accept that something was wrong. And I thought, well, why didn't he tell me that then? Why is he saying this now? I would have called the police straight away. Michael formally reported Jenna's disappearance to the police that evening. And after being interviewed, Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Renane and his team were appointed to investigate the case. I first met Mike and Desiree in the first few days of the inquiry. Desiree struck me as a very honest individual. She knew her daughter very, very well. Michael was concerned for, for Jenna. He talked about the, the impact Jenna had on the family and how Desi was obviously upset the fact that Jenna had been seen for a couple of days. And whilst there were obviously difficulties with Jenna, with her schooling, there was nothing really that different to other teenagers and certainly uh, no reason why she should go missing for any, any length of time. Since Michael was the last person to see Jenna, he was invited to Pontypool Police Station to be interviewed for a second time. No, but you know, we got, we got, got on with when she Jenna went until she started growing up and growing up, and then she's, you know, she they get, they get bigger and bigger, and then they start getting cheeky, man. 
However, when the conversation turned to the girl with the red hair, the detectives became even more concerned. This girl with the red hair had never been seen before, never been seen in the house, never been referred to by Jenna. And he hadn't really taken much notice of that individual and most parents in those circumstances we thought would have asked more questions. But then Michael explained how his relationship with Jenna had been difficult for some time. There was talk of arguments between them and Mike uh, having maybe a, a bit of a dislike to Jenna because of her behaviour, because of the way she, she started to speak to her mum, and the language that apparently Jenna was using within the house in front of the younger children. Mike certainly didn't, didn't like that. Michael left the police with little to go on, and the detectives had to consider whether Jenna might have either run away or had an accident. They even had to consider the possibility that Jenna had been abducted or even murdered. The difficulty was that we had about four different main lines of inquiry, and I couldn't put all my eggs into any one basket, but all the indicators were starting to emerge that there was a problem. In order to learn more about Jenna, police officers interviewed her friends and discovered that she was a typical 15-year-old girl. When we were in school, we'd just probably be in my bedroom with our music on. One wall was just like mirrored wardrobes. And we just, we'd sit in my mirrors for hours and just do our makeup, our hair. We used to just do silly things like that, really. But Jenna was mature for her age. Yeah, she had a good head on her shoulders. She was she like a 15-year-old. She was a very outgoing person who got on with a lot of people. And her friends also explained when they had last seen Jenna. The actual last sighting we had was around lunchtime uh, on the 5th of September. And this was backed up by school friends who had seen her then. The detectives were also interested to hear more about Jenna and her recent behaviour. We started to establish uh, a picture of, of Jenna talking about wanting to run away from home and not happy at home. And they painted a picture of this girl who, who just really wanted to up sticks and leave. And at one stage they were even talking about she wanted to run away to London. Possibly she could have gone, could have gone anywhere. But when police officers carried out an inventory of Jenna's clothing, they realised that if Jenna had run away, she didn't seem to have taken anything with her. If she'd gone missing, and she'd been missing for any length of time, she would have taken certain items, makeup, a teddy bear, certain items of clothing that she particularly loved and wore all the time, uh, and they hadn't gone. As the investigation gained momentum, Desri was also proactive in starting a campaign of her own. There was a telephone call that came in from Pontnewenil, so I rang back. Somebody had picked up the phone and, and told me that um, where the phone box was. Hoping the call was from her daughter, Desri immediately headed down to the phone box on the outskirts of Pontypool, but found no sign of Jenna. My friend made up some posters of Jen, put the telephone number on the bottom, and I went down to Pontywood and started sticking them up on all the lampposts in all the pubs. But I didn't have one phone call to say that Jenna was down there. The detectives also felt it was important to ask members of the public for help, and so Desri took part in a press appeal. But a huge response from the public created its own problems. We were having numerous telephone calls of possible sightings in Cumbran, Newport, Cardiff, which resulted in us attending the area, seizing CCTV, sitting down viewing the CCTV to try and identify Jenna. So straight away, it became a, a very labour-intensive inquiry. In an effort to identify the mysterious red-headed girl, crime scene investigators visited the Baldwin's house to look for clues. Trying to trace that female, trying to find an unusual party's fingerprints within the home, I actually went back to try and locate dyed red hair. That was all negative. There was nothing. As the investigation progressed, detectives also interviewed Jenna's ex-boyfriend, Chris Jones. When they got together, their relationship was good. He was older, but then she was very mature for her age, and I got on with him really well. 
but Michael was unhappy about the age difference between the couple. She was 13 and he was 17, and initially it was World War Three in our house. What was said by you then to Jenna about you not being happy with this relationship? I can't remember now. Mike would have nothing to do with it at all. Mike wouldn't have him near the house. Although the relationship lasted two years, the couple eventually broke up. It was obvious she was moving on. He still wanted to be with her. He found it really difficult. But Jenna had outgrown him by that time. She was ready to be back with her friends. Chris explained to the detectives that although the breakup had been difficult, the couple had worked through their problems. They were still very good friends. In fact, the week before Jenna was reported missing, Jenna had been seen um, outside on her patio, uh, lying on the patio, talking to Chris, who would quite often come down and have a chat with Jenna. So, so there certainly wasn't a relationship that had split up and they weren't talking, they were still very close. She had a lot of feelings for Chris. She was beginning to start her life. She was just getting on with it, but I do believe deep down that she did love him. Since Jenna often spent time at her ex-boyfriend's house, a forensic search of his home was also ordered. And when the crime scene investigators arrived at the property, they were instantly concerned. And the forensic team had gone into to, to the premises and there was drawings on paper and on the door of a coffin with Jenna RIP written on it. During the forensic examination, there appeared to be what were traces of blood uh, on items of clothing. Obviously, all these put together highlighted the fact that they could be well be more involved, and that's the point that the gentleman was arrested on suspicion of murder. When Chris was arrested, I was shocked. Part of me thought, perhaps he does know where Jenna is, but another part of me thought, I know he wouldn't hurt her. Back at Pontypool Police Station, Jenna's ex-boyfriend, Chris, was refusing to comment. He was kept in custody over a period of day. Uh, myself and my colleague interviewed him, and he initially wouldn't talk to us. However, the detectives were able to build a picture of how the couple spent their time together. From exercise books and Jenna's work books, his books that we seized at the time, they both seemed to enjoy um, various forms of art. Both of them would openly draw things like the coffin with their names on and RIP underneath, and drawing on doors. It's just the way they, they, they treated uh, the, the establishment. And the results of the forensic examination also started to clarify the situation. There were items found that the address had blood on it, which was tested and proved to be an apparent blood stain. But it was analysed and this was never found to be Jenna's blood. Believing they had simply uncovered examples of rebellious teenage behaviour, the detectives released Jenna's ex-boyfriend. It seemed the police were back to square one but they were about to make a crucial discovery. When first interviewed, her parents had explained that Jenna had telephoned Michael on the 9th of September, four days after she had last been seen. In the first instance, simply to trace that call and find out where uh, she'd made it from. The service provider for the mobile phone uh, call quickly came back to us and said that the call hadn't been made. Now that obviously caused us major concern and really was the point at which I thought we had an issue here with Michael Baldwin. Meanwhile, another team of police officers following up leads generated by the press appeal made a remarkable discovery. We had a series of phone calls from telephone boxes they were always anonymous. And that was unusual, to have a series of phone calls like that that were, in effect, untraceable. We started to look at possibly where, where was Michael when these phone calls were made. Uh, and it soon became clear that he actually wasn't with Desiree or actually in the home. So that obviously again started raising concerns. Michael's behaviour clearly implicated him in his stepdaughter's disappearance. And to understand his actions, DCI Renane employed some specialist help. We decided to speak with a clinical forensic psychologist to see whether they could give us some advice and guidance on uh, how we might find out if he was in fact making these calls and for what reason he was making them. Was he just supporting 
Desiree? Was he simply making the calls in the hope that she would turn up one day, or, or was he involved in a more sinister way? The psychologist devised a number of triggers which Michael would hopefully respond to, and the first was designed to prove whether or not he was making the telephone calls. We decided to emphasise to Michael Baldwin that if Jenna didn't contact us, then we would obviously have to scale up the inquiry and just emphasise that we needed some form of proof that she was alive. Having set the plan into action, DCI Renane then instructed a surveillance team to observe Michael's movements. I fully expected Michael Baldwin to simply go to a telephone box and make a call. Under surveillance, Michael Baldwin went out and purchased a mobile phone under a false name. The surveillance team then observed Michael going into a telephone box and unwrapping the new phone before discarding the packaging in a nearby car park. We seized that packaging immediately. From the packaging, we were able to identify the IMEI numbers of the phone, the actual telephone number of the mobile, uh, and then from forensic examination, that's where the box and its contents, Mike Baldwin's fingerprints were all over it. Amazingly, Michael Baldwin then started to make silent phone calls to the family purporting to be Jenna Baldwin. Suddenly, the detectives had a prime suspect in their investigation into Jenna's disappearance. But it was a definitive moment because we knew that Michael Baldwin was now lying. He'd been lying for some time, but we were determined to find out where she was. In September 2002, detectives from Gwent Police launched a missing persons inquiry following the disappearance of Jenna Baldwin, a 15-year-old girl from Pontypool in South Wales. As the investigation progressed, the police soon became concerned by the behaviour of Jenna's stepfather, Michael Baldwin, when they discovered that he had lied about receiving a telephone call from his daughter days after she had last been seen. And Baldwin was soon established as a prime suspect when he was observed purchasing a mobile telephone, which he then used to make silent calls home, whilst pretending they were from Jenna. The phone calls varied from total silence to even sort of very low tones of whispering to like low purring noises. Um, but obviously, at that time, no words were actually spoken. Desri also started receiving a number of text messages. I knew straight away that she wasn't writing them. I knew the way that Jenna texted and wrote, and she could spell, and this person couldn't spell. I was glad that she texted me, but then worried. Why couldn't she phone and tell me where she was? But to deflect attention away from himself, Baldwin would make sure he was present when calls or text messages were received. So it was quite clear that he'd used the mobile phone to ring the landline, come downstairs, to give the impression that, hang on, look, I'm you, it's not me doing this, and then went back upstairs and switched the phone back off again. And in order to keep up the pretense, Baldwin even took part in a second press appeal. What I was made to feel was that somebody was there with her, stopping her from ringing me, stopping her from being in contact with me, and that she was... She'd been abducted and held, she was being held against her will. Confused and desperate, Desri then took it upon herself to send her own messages asking questions that only Jenna knew the answers to. After my dad had died, my brother took over the house and him and Jen painted radiators. So I asked, what did you paint in Grancher's house? And it came back a Christmas painting and I just threw the phone. I thought, I, I couldn't cope anymore with it. Desri then told Baldwin that Jenna had failed to provide the right answer to her question. But it wasn't long before the mistake was corrected. I sat there thinking, Jen, where the hell are you? And I texted her. 
asking her where she was in desperation really and they came back and it said two radiators I painted two radiators and I was elated rang the family liaison officers she's alive she's alive because by that time I thought she was dead all the while, the police surveillance team were watching Baldwin as he sent each of the messages to his heartbroken wife. Although Baldwin was clearly involved, Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Renane still didn't know the circumstances of Jenna's disappearance and instructed his team to re-interview key witnesses. And when her friends were interviewed for a second time, they confirmed that Michael and Jenna's relationship was far from amicable. He had a from a young age of two. She should have grown to love that man, not, not to despise him. You could just see in her emotions when she looked at him, there was nothing. Um, some friends said they were actually present on previous occasions. And even though Jenna's friends were present, Mike straight away was abusive, using foul language towards Jenna, telling her to shut up, telling her to get out of the house. And there was occasions that Mike actually shouted at the friends to get out. And Jenna would come out then shortly afterwards to say that, oh, he just grabbed me, or oh, he just pushed me. However, it was when the police officers re-interviewed the family's neighbours that the pieces of the puzzle seemed to fall into place. And one of the neighbours told us about an incident where she was aware of Jenna shouting, uh, shouting and screaming outside the house. Mike had better come down and open the door. The detectives were able to establish that this event took place on Thursday the 29th of August, a week before Jenna was last seen by anyone other than Baldwin. She remembers Jenna shouting words to the effect of, don't laugh at me, Mike, you'll be the one leaving when my mum finds out. Uh, and she formed the opinion that Jenna had obviously been dragged into the house. And it was at that point then she said she heard Jenna screaming. This new information not only revealed why Jenna had been staying away from home, but also the possibility that she was about to divulge an explosive secret. Deep down, I believe Jenna had a big secret. I think maybe she felt a bit scared of what if she had opened up, if it was something really, really bad, she may have felt like she could have caused a lot of misery for her mum, her brother, her sister, and maybe she just wanted to get out and get on with it. Believing this secret could hold the key to Jenna's disappearance, DCI Renane felt he had no option but to proceed on the premise that Michael Baldwin had murdered his stepdaughter. My biggest challenge at that time was, where was Jenna? And how do we get Michael Baldwin to, in some way, show us where Jenna was or give some indication of what had happened to her? The investigating officers needed a break in the case, and during a further examination of Baldwin's financial records, they noticed a discrepancy in his alibi for Friday the 6th of September, the day after Jenna was last seen by her friends. We knew that Des had gone to work that morning. Mike had worked nights the night before, on Thursday the 5th. Mike actually took his children to school around half past eight, nine o'clock. He said he went to bed. Through financial investigation, we were able to prove that at two minutes to nine that morning, cash was withdrawn from his account uh, to the value of £10. But then what we did have then, some 15 minutes later, was a transaction to the value of £18.95. The detectives made further inquiries and were stunned when they discovered what Baldwin had spent the money on. Significantly, we'd found that he'd purchased a shovel from a shop in Pontypool using his credit card, luckily for us, because he didn't have the cash available. Being in mind, he's telling us that the last time he saw Jenna was on Tuesday the 12th. Why is he buying a shovel on Friday the 6th? Not only did this revelation suggest that Baldwin might have buried Jenna's body, but also that she was murdered less than 24 hours after last being seen by her friends on Thursday the 5th of September. If the detectives could prove that this was the case, then Baldwin had also lied about the existence of the girl with the red hair and Jenna's drug fueled state back on Tuesday the 10th of September. The search for Jenna intensified with crime scene investigators examining any possible area where Michael might have tried to dispose of his stepdaughter's body. It involved 
for mountain searches, quarry searches, streams being searched by subaqua units. We also used um, sniffer dogs um, trained uh, in identifying um, bodies uh, and we used those on various sites but again nothing, nothing came of light. And whilst the police scoured the area for clues, DCI Renane ordered a second forensic examination of the Baldwin's house. Scientists, fingerprint officers, and literally took the house apart piece by piece. There was nothing to indicate an attack site at that address. There was none of the usual blood spatter or cleaning, and a scientist looked at it and said he could find nothing other than what he'd expect in your normal home. Throughout the investigation, the detectives continued to monitor Baldwin's behaviour whenever they revealed new information to the family. He became very defensive when we were speaking with Desiree, would often leave the room, uh, wouldn't engage with, with the family liaison officers, and really, after a while, wanted to take no part uh, in the inquiry. But still convinced that the police would give up looking for Jenna's body if they thought she was alive, Baldwin continued to send the text messages and to telephone the house. During the time the texts were coming through, it was giving me hope. Hope that she was alive. But I was becoming increasingly suspicious of everybody because it was someone who knew Jenna really well. Towards the end, I, I didn't think that Mike was involved, but I stopped sharing information with people. He was clearly confident, I think, at that point in time, that he was probably convincing us that this was Jenna, she was making the text messages, she was making the silent phone calls, and that we would eventually go away. However, DCI Renane and the clinical forensic psychologist were ready to put the final part of their plan into action. As the scenario developed, it was clear that he wasn't going to return to the body straight away and we had to put in place a number of other prompts to see what he would do. And I remember I was um, making gravy for dinner. The police had asked me to text the phone and ask Jenna to send something personal to the house. And I thought at the time, I thought, well, that's not going to be any help to me, is it? You know, anybody can put a ring in the post. Is that on me and Jenna's all right? Although Desri didn't understand the reason for the request, DCI Renane was hoping Baldwin might lead them to Jenna's body. I knew that he was more likely to try to return to that body and actually take something from it in order to show that she was, in fact, still alive. But the plan didn't go quite as expected. Our surveillance team were following him virtually 24 hours a day, and he went out and was seen to put an envelope in the post. But clearly, we knew from a surveillance that he hadn't actually returned to the body. Although Baldwin had posted the ring, he had not led detectives to Jenna's body. When the, the ring turned up, Mike was there, and the police were there to open up the envelope. And it was one of my old engagement rings. And Mike said that he'd saw Jenna wearing it a couple of times but I assured the police that she'd never worn it. I'd never seen it on her. In order to confirm that Baldwin had sent the ring, DCI Renane requested the envelope to be fingerprinted and tested for DNA. The stamp was submitted as one item and the seal of the envelope as another for DNA comparison. The seal of the envelope, where it had been licked and shut, was Michael Baldwin. We discovered that the stamp had actually been licked by his daughter to actually put the stamp on that envelope. Uh, obviously, she didn't know what was inside. The detectives were certain they had enough evidence to prove beyond doubt that Baldwin had been involved in Jenna's disappearance. And suspecting him of murder, Michael Baldwin was arrested on Tuesday, October the 29th, 2002. When we did arrest him, he pleaded innocence and was initially quite dismissive and, again, quite confident to think that he could see it through and that we couldn't prove anything. But Baldwin was unaware that he had been under constant surveillance for weeks. When we started to put the information to him, the fact that he'd been under surveillance, he didn't know that. 
the fact that he'd purchased the mobile phone using a false name, the fact that obviously he'd been on the television knowing all this, pleading for her to return, meant that he was then in a very, very difficult position. But yet again, as he was talking to us, he, he kept giving us more light, which we were able to disprove. And the police had another problem to deal with. One of the difficult things at that point in time was to tell Desiree what had happened and what information we had, because she couldn't understand why we'd arrested her husband. Desiree was taken aback when she heard of Baldwin's arrest. I was really shocked and protective of him, really, because they'd already arrested Jenna's boyfriend, and that proved nothing. And I just thought it was a formality that he was going in to ask questions. But when Desri was presented with all the evidence collected by the police, her worst fears were confirmed. When I discovered that the police knew that it was Mike that bought the mobile phone and it was Mike that was texting me, I was in such a mess when I found out he bought the, the shovel. And that's when I knew my daughter was dead. And on Friday, the 2nd of November, 2002, Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Renane felt he had enough evidence to charge his prime suspect, Michael Baldwin, with Jenna's murder. And I think at that point in time, he probably knew that the game was up, but he still thought that he could get away with it if Jenna's body wasn't found. But what he didn't account for was the determination of Desiree Baldwin. 2002, Desri Baldwin dropped her daughter Jenna off at her aunt's house and never saw her again. Following an extensive investigation, Desri's husband Michael Baldwin was arrested for his stepdaughter's murder, but when questioned, he refused to reveal where he had buried Jenna's body. However, Desri wasn't ready to give up on her daughter, and when Baldwin asked her to visit him in prison, she agreed to his request. I said I'd go if he'd tell me where Jenna was. But when I got there, I couldn't even really look at him. Before I went in, I was hysterical. I said, well, I've come to find out where Jenna is. And he said, I don't know. I don't know, why should I know where she is? So I just got up and walked out. In the days that followed the visit, Baldwin kept calling Desri and eventually caught up with her when she and the children were visiting his parents. His mum said, Mike's got something to tell you. But when I went on the phone, he still wasn't telling me where Jen was. In a desperate bid to get him to reveal the whereabouts of her daughter's body, Desri even suggested a possible alibi. And I said to him, well, maybe something had happened. You accidentally killed her. Then it would be manslaughter and you'd only get, like, a few years but Baldwin still refused to admit any involvement, leaving Desiree with only one option. To him I said, well, if you don't tell me where she is, you won't see her children again. And he knew I meant that. And then he told me where she was. Um, he said to me, she's over the keeper's pond, down over in one of the laybys. Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Renane and his team were soon on the road, but when the detectives reached the area, there were no signs of any burial site. I still didn't trust him, even at that point, and I, I still wondered whether there was another chapter to this, to this particular story, and whether he was actually going to take us to the body. But Baldwin admitted defeat and took the police officers straight to the spot where he had buried Jenna. It wasn't until I physically saw Jenna, I thought, yes, he, he's eventually told us something which is truthful. In the early hours of Tuesday, the 19th of November, 2002, Jenna's body was found. The police came to the house with hearing so that they could identify Jenna. Part of me was happy that they found her because that was my goal. But then part of me, you know, the realisation that she wasn't coming back. And then I was just beside myself, absolutely beside myself. As the forensic archaeologist and his team excavated Jenna's body, Baldwin was questioned again 
and asked to provide a full confession. We said Jenna had come home. She was shouting and swearing at him whilst he was walking up the stairs. Um, she was hitting him. He said apparently he sort of lashed out and it was purely accidental, but Jenna fell down the stairs and stopped breathing. He described um, how he put her in the car with the intention of taking her to the hospital. But whilst driving, he said he was aware then that she was, she was dead. He panicked, he was crying, he was upset. Uh, and he stopped and for whatever reason, he decided to bury Jenna at that location. But when the crime scene investigators revisited the house and examined the scene of the supposed accident, they weren't convinced. If he'd have carried out the actions he said, he would have hit the wall, not Jenna. So it was, as he described it, it couldn't have happened. She could not have been pushed backwards down the stairs. And two extensive post-mortems on Jenna's body also failed to corroborate Baldwin's story. The confession he made was not consistent with the injuries that she had and anything else. If, as he said, she'd fallen down the stairs and died, you'd expect to find a fractured neck, broken back, some life-threatening injury, and there were none present. Normally, if you fall, any death is normally a slow process where the, the brain would actually swell, whereas Mike is now portraying and this fall down the stairs and death occurring almost instantaneously. So unfortunately, from the post-mortem, the cause of death was totally inconclusive. However, the investigation had also uncovered evidence that Baldwin had the technical ability to kill through his expertise in judo. He was uh, trained to a brown belt standard. As part of the brown belt uh, examination, he would have to demonstrate at least five strangulation moves, but to reach that standard, you would have known ten. But all these holes could prove fatal within seconds rather than prolonged strangulation. And again, this fitted in with what the pathologist was saying. The wealth of evidence already uncovered clearly indicated that Baldwin had murdered his stepdaughter. But without a full confession, detectives were left to draw their own conclusions as to the events of Thursday, the 5th of September, 2002. I think that Jenna came home that day, tried to get into the house. He was trying to either sleep or relax. There's no doubt that she was shouting and, and probably swearing to get in. I think there was confrontation. And I think whatever that confrontation was and whatever was said meant that Michael Baldwin decided at that point in time that enough was enough and that he was going to either kill her or he was going to really cause her some serious harm. And obviously with him being a a judo brown belt, a very, very big, strong man. Um, she would have stood no chance at all in any struggle with him. Hopefully, um, you know, she died quickly. But one of the most callous things that he then did was to obviously take her in the car, put her into the boot of that car, and took her down to Abergavenny uh, and buried her. You know, if he hadn't done that, if he'd just been open and honest at that point in time, he would have saved so much trauma and so much distress for all the family concerned. On Tuesday, June the 10th, 2003, Michael Baldwin's trial started at Cardiff Crown Court, and seven weeks later, he was found guilty of murdering his 15-year-old stepdaughter, Jenna Baldwin. And um, I can remember sitting down and thinking, gosh, they... They believed me, they believed us as a family, that, but it didn't actually sink in until like two or three weeks later how much we'd achieved. And... But even though Baldwin received a life sentence for his crime, he has never revealed exactly how or why he murdered Jenna. My own personal opinion, I believe something certainly happened on possibly more than one occasion between Mike and Jenna. The indication was that Jenna was about to tell um, Desiree something that in Jenna's opinion would, would mean Michael would be leaving the matrimonial home. And that is why Michael um, had to silence Jenna. Desri Baldwin is now left to rebuild her life whilst carrying the knowledge that the man she loved not only murdered her daughter, but also callously tormented her family and friends for over two months.
emailed it very hard, sending text messages to her phone, believing, her believing it was Jenna sat by her side of him. I expect she was getting all excited, and all along he was just sat there laughing. But, yeah, that's, that's the devil in him, I think. How could he possibly, you know, take a girl that had been part of their life and simply treat her like a piece of meat, put her into the back of a car and bury her? I mean, I've never really seen that done before and hopefully we won't see it done again. Over the years, he was a good husband to me and I didn't have any reason to doubt him with Jenna at all. Um, but Jenna changed quickly and now looking back something changed my little girl I don't know what that something was but Jenna had a secret and Jenna was going to tell me her secret but Mike stopped her you don't kill someone for nothing it wasn't an accident and I'll never believe it was an accident my daughter's gone and she was murdered.